you can be sad and we all you know have those overwhelming times but know know that the darkness is not a state a prison that hopefully it's some someday you get out of the darkness is actually moving you forward we're so happy to be here in LA spiritually hungry live yes there's a fundamental concept both in philosophy and many religions that everything in the world has a balancing or opposite side. Front and back, up and down, dark and light, which is our topic today. Psychologist A.J. Marsden wrote, no left without a right, no up without a down, no inside without an outside. Opposites give each other meaning and are, are connected to each other. It may be our imperfect, subjective and limited perspective more than anything else that determines whether something is light or dark, good or evil, positive or negative, and so forth. And if we enlarge our views, we will find that little, if anything, is completely one state or the other. If there are two sides, there are two sides of the same coin. So I'm really excited to unpack this because I think this is where we get into a lot of trouble in life. We are marred by things that have happened to us, maybe circumstances we were born into or trauma that happened over the years. And I think if we can take this perspective that everything has to have those two opposing forces because it's an opportunity for us to become the best version of ourselves, then I think we'll live very differently. And one of my favorite um, stories that represents this is the stories of two race car drivers, James Hunt and Nikki Lade. And Ron Howard created the film Rush, I think in 2013, about their story. I haven't seen it yet. You've recommended it a few times. It's so good. Yet. Let's watch it again together. Let's do that. Not that we ever have time to do that anymore, but yes, that would be fun. <laughs> so they were arch nemesis. They were equally great race car drivers, but they were so competitive with one another, they thought they hated each other. And then one day, Nikki Lade got into a horrible accident on the um, track and he had burns all over his body and he was in the hospital and while he's lying in the hospital, he's cursing and screaming at the TV while he's watching James Hunt run race after race after race. And as his lungs are being pumped and I mean, he was really in horrible shape, the doctor comes in and he says to him, stop thinking of it as a curse that you've been given an enemy in life. It can be a blessing too. A wise man gets more from his enemies than a fool does from his friends. And it reframed things for him. So once he got out of the hospital, they met up together and James Hunt said, I feel responsible for what happened to you. And he said to him, you are, but you were equally responsible for getting me out of that bed and racing again. And from that place, they became friends. But I think it's such a perfect example of the things we think if we could just remove that person or that situation or that diagnosis or whatever it is, then, then everything would be fine. Then I would find happiness or nirvana or whatever you want to call it. Absolutely. But it's not really that Actually, way. Actually, if I can stop you, because we don't... We expect you to stop me and interrupt. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> By the way, every once in a while, we get some hate mail to the podcast <laughs> about how I interrupt Monica. So I apologize ahead. Um, <laughs> Uh, I wanted to actually ask uh, a question to our, to our friends here in the audience. Raise your hand if there's something in your life right now that is, well, in Monica's words, something you would want removed or something that is challenging you. So raise your hands. Yes, yes. By the most, way, I didn't most, expect to say this, but I read yes. uh, in an article, somebody started like a fake online thing, like if you want to get rid of somebody... I'm your person, right? Oh, really? No, but as like, as a joke, like literally as a joke, as a fake, like, yeah, just, and then he got people writing in and he posted what they were asking. And I'm reading this and I'm like, I cannot, even one person was like, my father just doesn't let me use the remote control when I want. Can you kill him? <laughs> really? Yeah, no, I mean, literally like crazy things wow. or like, like just things that you're, you're thinking like, well, how are you not thinking? I mean, I don't even understand because they were n nothing was serious. It wasn't like they were like being <laughs> raped every night or like these were just like they didn't, you know, I don't feel loved. You know, can you break their legs or right. I just crazy. But well, so I'm yeah. so, sorry, sorry. So what well, the point, of course, being is that every single one of us has most of us at least have something in our life even right now that in the I would say wrong, but different consciousness, you would say, oh, I wish 
this didn't exist in my life. But I hope that from what we share tonight, um, we come to the point, we, we not only embrace it on some level, we actually start desiring it. And that might be a higher level, but again, I, I think the other to, part of that is for the race car drivers, right? They took the challenges between them as being personal. And I think that's where we really get in trouble. We think that things that are happening, the way somebody spoke to us or looked at us or didn't look at us or whatever energy we didn't get that we wanted, that it's deeply personal and it was intentional. When really everybody's living their lives thinking the same thing, right? They're not even really paying attention to you. They're so wrapped up in their own version of chaos or what's happening. And when they stopped seeing it as personal, then they could see that they were really the best things for one another. Right. So I'm going to cut you off. You were talking about yes. the, <laughs> the ability to actually not want those parts of our lives to be removed. Yeah, I mean, it's human nature, right? We think that we don't want opposition. Um, so the, I guess the question that we are positing tonight is how do you find light in the darkness? So there's a parable I thought was kind of cute. One day the darkness said to the light, I hear so much about you, so why can't I see all of you? To which the light replied, because if you were to fully see me, you would no longer exist. And the same would be true if I were to see all of you. And as a result, the two decided to remain separate but equal partners in games of shadow and light. And so was the world of forms and shapes born. And so much of life is like this parable. parable. It's the interplay of opposites always playing one against the other. So it's not that we want the absence of challenges. It's we want to be able to get to a place where we recognize that the challenges were seeds that were able to grow our blessings and joy. Well, let me ask you, this is based on one of my more favorite teachings. But if I asked you, I have asked any of our friends here tonight, we have in life really two baskets of occasions, right? There's the times we wake up in the morning and we're excited and we're inspired and throughout the day we're doing what we love doing or enjoy doing and that takes up a certain percentage of our life. And then there are those days, hours, months sometimes where we feel the heaviness of life. Something is happening, something that we're going through. Which of those is more important? You're stealing my thunder. Oh, I'm sorry. So there's sorry. two types of light. Is that where you're going? Well, no, what I was going to say is, and this is one of the one of the very important Kabbalistic teaching, that when a person looks back at their life, what will be the most important are not the great days. They're beautiful, and we should enjoy them, and we should appreciate them. But the most powerful times in our life are going to, we're going to as we look back at them and also when our soul leaves this world and it looks back at our life, it will look back at those minutes, hours, days of challenge and darkness from which we were able to extract even one spark of light. Right, so it's two, there's two kinds of light, right? There's light from light and there's light from darkness. So the first one I think you were describing is light from light, where let's say today I had a great day, everything went my way, I feel really good, I'm happy, got the parking space where I wanted to, and this other thing happened that I wanted, and it's just so great, and I was even able, I was nice to somebody, and kind, and just felt great. I went to bed, it's like, oh, it's just a great day, it's such a light-filled day, right? I helped some people, everything worked my way, the universe supported me in that, great. Did I get light from that day? Yeah, I got some light. Then there's light from darkness, and that is where you feel worried or hectic and you've run from place to place and maybe you even lost your temper and you lashed out at somebody and it's really not going your way. And then at some point in the day, you were like, wow, I can actually choose my consciousness. I can choose my response. I can start my day over at any moment. You know, I love doing that, right? Nine o'clock wasn't great. 10 wasn't great. 12 was even worse. One o'clock, wait, I can restart my day and choose something else, right? In those moments where I took 10 seconds to shift my consciousness and maybe do an act of sharing and go out of my way to really still engage with the energy that that day has to offer, that is light from darkness. And that kind of light is so much more powerful. It's life-changing, really, for the person. It's actually the only reason our soul came into this world. 
And I think that that's a very, very important understanding. Because we usually beat ourselves up. Oh my God, I, I lost my temper today to my child or the stranger or whatever. And then right away you want to take it back. And then what happens is we spend the rest of the day beating ourselves up. Or maybe we just want tomorrow to start already or we've written off that day. When in fact, that is perfectly set up for each one of us to be able to say, wait a second, this is where change happens. This is how it happens. When I can choose something in the moment where I, I don't feel like it, it's the last thing that I want to do. And I don't even think it's possible. You dig so deep into the better part of yourself, that you are able to change that day and thereby change yourself. Absolutely. And I, I think I want to take just pause a moment here because I think it's such an important understanding and it's not our natural way of thinking. The phrase, which is the Aramaic phrase of that teaching, which is that we are not in this world to bring light from light. We are in this world, and the real the purpose of our soul and the way that we actually achieve our greatest growth is what the term in Aramaic is nehora miko chashucha, light out of darkness. And when you think about your life in that way, again, as we said before, you appreciate, of course, those days when everything is going right. But when the day is not going right, when you are feeling that heaviness for, for whatever reason, internal or external, you have the ability to say, this isn't just a terrible thing I'm going through or a bad thing I'm going through. There's a purpose to this. Not only is there a purpose to this, but that this is actually the purpose of life. To be able to go through those experiences and yes, grab a moment of some light, of some elevation, and we're able, again, to reframe our, you know, our, our lives in that way when we do, and we absolutely will experience those challenges and those challenging times and days, it gives us much greater, I think, excitement or inspiration to go through them. And if I can share, it's an idea that you know, many of us know, one of my more favorite stories, the biblical stories, the story of Jonah. And um, I'm assuming so many of us have heard the story. Many people know that story. Oh, well, I'll tell the story. Stories you want, okay, you want to tell the story? No, okay, I I'll tell the story. story. So the story I is... I want to hear great juicy details about how you felt so emotional about it and you loved the story. Oh. <laughs> and about it, about yeah, Monica, those of you who listen to the podcast know Monica likes when I enjoy when I share personal stuff. This isn't necessarily that, but I will. It's I will. Never I promise that. you. <laughs> I will. I promise. I will. So the story of Jonah, right? So the story of Jonah is um, Jonah was a, a young man who was called upon to to bring a message of change to, to a city, to a place called Nineveh. And he does not want to do it for different reasons, so he decides to run away from his purpose. That's the way the story begins. And as many of us know, the story continues. He, he takes a boat, uh, and he tries to leave town, and the huge storm comes, and he, the boat is about to be swallowed up by the ocean, and they throw lots, and they find out to ask, God, you know, who, whose fault is the fact that we're in this storm? Whose fault is it that we're about to all die in this boat? And the lot fell on Jonah. And Jonah says it's true that this storm and this difficult situation is my fault because I'm trying to run, run away from, from my calling. So he says the only answer, the only solution to your problem is to throw me overboard. And Jonah is thrown overboard and he's swallowed up, and this is the story, He's swallowed up by a well, and he's in there for three days, and he experiences great darkness. And then after three days of pain, of darkness, he is, he finally, and he's meditating, and he's praying, and he's begging, and he's crying. And the well, it says, th throws him out onto the land, and there he is awakened again. He realizes there's no way of running away from your life's purpose, and he goes and he brings the message, and he brings great transformation. But what I think is really interesting about the Jonah story, or more importantly, the story of Jonah being swallowed by the whale, and this, again, I think is such a beautiful way to reframe our challenging times. Jonah was experiencing darkness, as we all do at different times. But it wasn't that he was stagnant in his darkness. I think the mistake that we often make of thinking is, I'm in the prison of darkness. Sometimes it's a great darkness, sometimes it's a minor darkness. And I just can't go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm stuck. And only when the clouds of darkness will be removed, then I'll finally be able to do something purposeful or do something. The secret of the story of Jonah is that even while he was in the darkness, the whale was bringing him towards his purpose. 
And even though he didn't see that, just knowing that darkness... I mean, by keeping him in his belly. Keeping him in his belly. And then he brought him to the land, to the city of Nineveh, where he had to give his message. And the point is, the mistake that we think, that we make in thinking about darkness is we believe it's a prison. More importantly, it's a prison that traps us and we're not moving. When you reframe that understanding, which is that darkness is actually movement. It's movement that maybe I don't understand. It's movement that is not my choice. But just as Jonah was being moved in the belly of the whale towards his purpose, while experiencing great sadness and darkness, that really is both the purpose and the way to experience darkness. You can be sad, and we all you know, have those overwhelming times, but know, know that the darkness is not a state, a prison, that hopefully it's some, someday you get out of. The darkness is actually moving you forward. So this is the concept, the process is the purpose. And right, and here the, the darkness. Right, the, because the, process, process, nobody likes process, especially Aquarians and other signs that want fast, 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 that right? Was a, that was a call out to our son. I did not say that. You did not, you cannot blame me tonight. <laughs> no, no. And so process, nobody really likes, but process that if we use the story of Jonah, he's wet, he's in a, a fish, a whale, a mammal, whatever, swimming to what and he's thinking probably everybody else is having a great life why am i stuck here why am i suffering why am i being punished right that's where we go to so we never really especially when it's extreme especially when it's so hard and you think that you have nothing left to be able to survive or to to surpass that that great challenge but those are the moments and it's hard to keep that perspective unless you have a belief system that everything that is happening to you is happening through you and for you. And that's the big shift that has to happen for people to be able to recognize that darkness is a way to get to light. And, and more important, and again, I, I, wanna, I do want to underscore this idea that even when we're in darkness and sad and crying and we feel that it is all encompassing, know that that darkness is moving you forward. And even, again, even if in the moment you can't embrace that darkness, but know that just as Jonah in the darkness of the well was being brought towards his purpose, every time, whether it's a moment, again, an hour or a day, that darkness is moving you forward. And as a matter of fact, the reality is, and I think many of us have experienced this in life, that it is those moments of challenge, of darkness, that are probably used properly and understood properly, are probably the greatest movement forward rather than the times that we're inspired and feeling good and so on. So you've given the answer, but it's not easy to get there. It's just knowing, yeah, no, know that this is all for your greatest good, right? We talk a lot about that. I think what it comes down to ultimately is certainty, having certainty in the process, especially when it's unknown, the outcome. So I love talking about certainty because I think it's a buzzword that people don't even really know what it means anymore. Yeah, I'm certain, you know, sometimes certainty to some people is positive thinking. Sometimes it's just believing. Um, so I want to just unpack what certainty is by talking about what it isn't. And I spoke about this a few weeks ago, but I think it's really worth going through it again. So certainty isn't something we use to get what we want, right? Often people are like, I'm so certain I'm really, I'm certain I'm going to find my soulmate. I'm certain I'm going to find my dream job. I'm certain that I'm going to make all the money I want. That's not really certainty, though. Certainty is saying I'm going to do everything that I can to manifest those things. And even though the soulmate still isn't there, it's having certainty that it's going to come to you because you're doing the work to to bring that to you. And you understand that even though that person's not there, maybe they're going to move in next door or there's still some work for you to do. So certainty is being able to trust completely that the hand of the creator is in everything and not just saying, I know. Certainty, and by the way, um, to that point, and I, I shared this too, that and there's a really powerful story of one of our, our students here tonight has about that, but a few weeks ago, um, I had a challenge where I had a bully like come up to me and 
Um, it was as if she slapped me in the face. Out of nowhere, I haven't seen this person in 10 years accusing me of really horrible things. And she just wasn't going to hear anything I had to say because she fully believed whatever she believed. And I remember walking away feeling really upset and, and sad and bullied, you know? But then there's nobody to talk to. So what did I have to do? I stopped and say, okay, the creator's hand is in this also. I don't know why. I don't know what in that moment it's supposed to do, but I know that it's the best thing for me. And I came to some different conclusions. You know, I think if you step into a role of leadership, then you're going to take on a lot of stuff for a lot of people. And it's going to make me stronger into the person I need to be. It doesn't matter what the person thinks of me. It doesn't matter if I can ever let her know the truth. It, it's not even about that. It was an opportunity for me to get to that place of total certainty that the hand of the creator is in that. So I would like to, I don't know if we have another mic, but our friend Kenny Fisher is here. And I'd like him to, um, if he wants to share his story, just... because when I have to tell you, and I didn't tell you this earlier tonight, when this happened to me with this bully, we talked about your story because it physically happened to you. It, it felt like it happened to me. And, I, and your story kind of made it all make sense. I wear these because uh, about a year and a half ago, I went in for a uh, cataract uh, operate, which is the easiest thing in the world. It's easier than going to the dentist. But unfortunately, they found that I had an ocular melanoma under my right eye. So that's malignant cancer. So I was all upset, and I said, but you know what, Mr. Fisher? Uh, 10 years ago, we would have to take your eye. Today, here at the Stein Eye Institute, we're gonna take a piece of gold about the size of your fingernail, and we're gonna beat it to paper thin, and then we're gonna put six radioactive diodes on it, and we're gonna put it in a bubble, and we're gonna put it behind your eye. And it's gonna stay there for a couple months. And they took it out, and you know, thank God, the cancer was gone. So it's a long process of healing, and like I, I couldn't drive because the lights were too bright, and the lights sometimes in here are so bright that I have to wear these glasses. So about three months ago, I'm walking to the center. Uh, we live on the other side of Pico. I'm coming down Robertson, and when I get almost to the corner, this tall guy, kind of light-skinned, hits me right across my neck just right across here and knocks me down to the ground. And I get up and I, I, he was gone. I was so upset. I mean, honest, I was screaming and yelling and all the way to the center, I was cursing the guy and, and I, went, I did my mikvah and I came out and I sat down and I opened my siddur and I could read. I could read perfectly. And it was like, I mean, I know I could read better than I could read before I had the operation. So, Curse, blessing, if that wasn't an angel, I don't know who was. Thank you. So, thank you, Kenny. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Such a, I think it's such a powerful story because that person who was opposition, who, you know, Kenny didn't deserve that, right? But then what did it do? It created this opening for this greatest blessing, right? So we just don't know. So certainty also isn't pretending that we don't have fear or doubt. If you are living and breathing, you will have fear and doubt. It's just part of it. Sure, can you have lesser or greater depending on what you work on? Yes, but that is a part of life. So it's not like, oh, I'm so certain, I'm certain, I have no fear. No, it's okay to be afraid. Certainty is being able to go ahead and do the things that you need to do in spite of feeling full of fear or doubt. It's doing it anyway and knowing that ultimately it's going to be the best thing for you. It's working through that. Certainty isn't the same thing as belief. When we say that we believe in something, it indicates that we have the ability to also not believe in it. It implies that we have decided what we believe. And your father, the Rav, would often talk about this. It's not about belief, it's about knowing. It's a deep knowing in your heart that again, as you know the sun is going to rise, each day, it's a knowing that every single person, every single obstacle, every single challenge, every single fear or worry or doubt that you find in front of you in your life is absolutely as it is as it should be. And, and I think, and the idea is again, we, with that, you come to be able to embrace and even at an ultimate level to enjoy those challenges or those moments of darkness. And there's a 
a very famous Kabbalist from a few thousand years ago. His name is Nahum Ishgamzu, which means Nahum, who when anything happened in his life, he would say, this is also for the good, which means even though his experience in that moment was dark, his experience in that moment was of a great challenge, he didn't experience it as light in that moment, but he embraced it because he knew that ultimately it was going to be for his benefit. And I think, you know, when we talk about spirituality, the study and the work, that might be the most important test that we should have for ourselves. You know, if you ask somebody, what does it mean to be spiritual? And I think for me, and I think for, for, for our friends here tonight and our listeners, I think that should be the most important test. How embracing are you more today than yesterday, more tomorrow than today, of those times of darkness, of those times of challenge? And you wanted me to share something personal, so I'll share something personal. Monica really enjoys this. I hope everybody here in our listeners... It's probably going to be about me. No, 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 it's not about you. (laughs) No, no. So so in the past weeks, I noticed something very interesting. So in, in, you know, part of the gift, or call it part of the work that we do, you know, we have many students from all over the world, and whenever they go through the challenges, they're always texting us, calling us, you know. In the past week or so, there's been a lot. thought, by the way, you had this, this morning. Thought. So it's been, it's been a lot. It's been a lot. I mean, like, literally, like, I had, I had it, the past 24 hours, I had a call at 5.30, 5.30 in the morning. Somebody's close relative passed away uh, the night before. Somebody texted me that, um, that they're, uh, they were going through, they Unwell. found out a very a big uh, health challenge the, the, a few hours before that. A student Funeral. From, uh, that also, uh, yeah, yeah, a funeral that I had to, uh, and then before that, a student was sharing me their son is is addicted, is, is back to his addictions. I mean, so, and I just felt just in the past few days, and I share this with Monica, and now with all of you, that it was, you know, sort of, you sort of feel the weight of that, right? I mean, literally, um, almost every hour or so, there was another call or another text, and, but, but, the point is, for me, it wasn't about, oh, well, okay, let me be happy now. You know, sometimes you're supposed to experience the weight, and that is part of the process, as we said before. It's actually the more important part of the process. But for me, what it was is that understanding, okay, no, so this is heavy now, and you're, you're not sort of in the state that you'd no- naturally or normally be, but that's moving you forward. And I think the embracing of the darkness or the heaviness as even if you don't see it or necessarily understand it, as moving you forward. That's the, the ultimate test or the ultimate, really, state of being spiritual. And what I would say to that is, is that the only way you can really come to that is if you're truly focused in life to transform. You know, some people come to spirituality or spiritual wisdom, and what they want is... I don't know if you call it a quick fix, but what can I do to get these things that I want? Or what can I do to be happy? And all those things, by the way, are an important part of the spiritual work. They're not the most important part of the spiritual work. It also can't be the end goal. No. The most important part of the spiritual work is knowing that whoever I am today, I have to become different. My ego has to be diminished. What we call in capitalistic terms, my selfishness or my desire to receive for the self alone has to be diminished. If that's my goal, then it becomes much easier to embrace the dark times or the heavy times. If my singular goal is how can I continue with my ego or how can I continue with my selfishness, then I don't have any ideas for you. I don't have any advice for you. But I don't think people recognize that that's what they're doing necessarily. Well, okay. Well, I think it takes introspection and, and, and really asking yourself, why am I in any way trying to study spirituality or why am I trying to engage in this path? And hopefully it's not, well, I had this problem, I want to get over it, or I have this thing that I want, how do I get it, right? The real purpose of true spiritual study is the knowledge that the state that I am today, with the ego that I have, with the selfishness that I have, I want to transform that. And knowing that a big part of that process is going to be that there are going to be heavy times, that there are going to be dark times, and through that I become elevated. And through that, I, be, I can come, it's actually one of the only ways that I can come to be the person that I'm meant to be. And when you do that, that's when you're able to transform and ultimately embrace the, the darkness, ultimately embrace the heavy times. 
And if I can share, there's... That's why we need to practice each and every, every day. I mean, that was the, the fourth one before you oh, sorry. started sharing. Um, <laughs> or cut you off is the word you were looking for. <laughs> Certainty isn't something we should only use in times of need. And I think that's when people start to really get on their hands and knees, when something, they hear whatever, that's the worst thing, and then they really start trying to use it. And if you haven't built that muscle day in and day out, when you really need it in those big moments... You just do not have anything to, to call from or to gather from. And it's practicing in each and every day. And I've become so used to that, that as soon as I hear something that, let's say I planned something or I was invested in something and it's I've tried every way and it's a no, or even if I haven't tried, I'll show up at the airport and whatever it is, right away my brain starts to say, okay, that's not an option anymore. What else can I do? It's never about why did this happen and what is it meant to be? Because I think that's the other thing. When people, for instance, let's say they don't ever travel, they don't enjoy life, they spend all of their time working, they save up enough money to go away for two weeks a year, you plan the vacation, what happens? There's a hurricane, whatever it is. You can't go there anymore. You think, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm not meant to go on this trip. I'm not deserving. What? Right? We can go to that place where you can say, wow, okay, it's not supposed to be now. This is not an option. When else can I go? What else can I do? What can I do in those two weeks? I've already gotten off work. What are my other options? When you start to look at life like that, everything you realize is coming to you to support you in the best and most powerful way. Absolutely. And it's interesting. The other part of that is that you will find that it is those times of darkness, of heaviness, of challenge that actually enabled you to know yourself better. There's a really nice essay by Oscar Wilde where he speaks about the poet. And he says that the poet is one step nearer to the truth. And the understanding is that when we are, when things are going our way, we don't usually take the time to look inside. One of the great gifts of challenging times, one of the great gifts of opposition, is that if used properly, and it needs to be used properly, it gives us the time to truly cut, to come to truth. To see ourselves. About ourselves, to see our lives. If we did not have those times of darkness, again, not everybody uses them as we're supposed to use them, but if we did, if we did not have those times of darkness, then we would never come to a true knowledge of ourselves and maybe changes that we need to make or a truer knowledge of our lives and changes that we need to make. Exactly. Negative emotions, negative thoughts are meant for us to take pause and say, how can I see things differently? How can I be different, what do I need to change? But if we're constantly looking at why and who did it and what's it all about from a, you know, I want this to go away, you're never gonna get to that place. Right, and to that point, and again, if you, I, this is a, a big idea that I'll explain in a short way. There's a section in the Zohar that speaks about three words, locks, openings, and chambers. Locks, locks. Op locks opening, and chambers. And what the Zohar says is that when you come to a place that seems closed to you, right? So a person wants their soulmate, they can't find them, or is going through a dark time and doesn't see the way out. That lock is not something that goes away, but if you persevere through the lock, it becomes an opening. And still, the opening is relatively small. If you persevere through the opening, it becomes a chamber filled with blessings. Mm. So the idea is that the darkness, when used properly, is not something, oh, I got out of that prison, or I got out of that darkness, or I got out of that, out of that challenge. Every lock or every time of darkness is when you persevere through it and you have the consciousness, the proper consciousness around it, and you push yourself and know and embrace it, becomes an opening. And then if, even though the opening is small, you persevere through the opening, it becomes a chamber filled with blessings. And the ultimate chamber filled with blessings for our lives can never be achieved if not through the lock, if not through that time of darkness. So when you understand that, and again, I do recommend if you have, for those of us who have the Zohar to actually study that section, but it's a beautiful and profound section. But what it does is it gives a true understanding of what darkness is. Darkness is the lock to the opening to the chamber full of blessings. But only, only if we persevere, only if we embrace it, only if we say, I don't want to get out of this. I want to transform this darkness into the opening, into the chamber filled with blessings. 
I love that. There's a great TED talk by Andrew Solomon. It's called How the Worst Moments in Our Lives Make Us Who We Are. And he said, I've come to feel that the truth is irrelevant. We call it finding meaning, but we might be better, call, we might be better off calling it forging meaning. In his book, Far From the Tree, he profiled families dealing with all kinds of challenges. One of the mothers he interviewed had two children with multiple severe disabilities. She told him, people always give us these little sayings like, God doesn't give you any more than you can handle. But children like ours are not preordained as a gift. They're a gift because that's what we have chosen. We find meaning and purpose in our biggest struggles by seeing things that way. I think it's such a powerful way. It's really forging meaning, right? Exactly. I, th I think this is, and maybe this is maybe the most important idea, which is related to what I was sharing before, is that if we know that the greatest moments of our lives at those times of darkness, why? Not because we go through them, but because by embracing them, we transform them into blessings. You know, and we have many life experiences like this where some people experience them and all they have are bad memories of that terrible thing that happened to them. On the other hand, they could have amazing memories how through that darkness they came to the opening into the chamber full of blessings. But that, that is the work of consciousness and that is the, the, the embracing of those dark times. He goes on to say, forge meaning and build identity. That became my mantra because he went through obviously some difficulties. Forging meaning is about changing yourself. Building identity is about changing the world. Forging meaning and building identity does not make what's wrong right. It only makes what's wrong precious. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so if I, before we ask some of our friends if they have, for questions, I would say probably for me and hopefully for, for our friends here and for our listeners, the most important change that comes from this understanding is not necessarily that you enjoy the darkness, but that you love it. Because you know that this is a place for me to persevere through. You love it or you know you need it? Well, you know you need it and you come to love it because it ultimately becomes your chamber filled with blessings. Mm -hmm. But not if you're trying to get out of there as soon as possible. And not if you see it as something to you know just get through. Those are the most important moments and situations in our, of our lives. Knowing that, and even when you're not enjoying it, knowing this is going to become an opening at some point. And that's this the thing, because our, our impulse is to, to push it away. Of course. And so, of course. obviously, this would be the greatest way to change your nature, because you're forced to do so just by embracing and it. And more than that, it's almost like, again, if you use, and that's why I think it's so powerful, this... This, that three word, you know, teaching. We go through life and we see the darkness and we go past it, forgetting that that was actually a Your, lock mm -hmm. to an opening to a chamber. And then the person goes through life and say, well, why have I never found my blessings? Why have I never found my light? Well, you went past every single one of them because you saw them as darkness and you went past rather than knowing that they were a lock to a room, to a chamber. And taking the time to open that lock. Exactly. And persevering and embracing it. Speaking yeah. of persevering, um, so we are talking about our the children's book, The Gift of Being Different. We went to, we've been to 15 schools. We've both spoken to thousands of kids in different states. We went to some schools this week, two today. And um, there's always one or two children that share, well, I don't like my superpower, which is their um, difference, right? It's too challenging, and I just want it to go away. And I think, and I love that they vocalize that. And then you have other kids that are already starting to recognize that this experience, this thing that they have that makes them different is actually what makes them really special, which is the message of our book. And always to that child, I say, you just are at the beginning of it. Everything is hard at first. And just know that this challenge is hoping is showing you something that is so beautiful about yourself that you haven't learned how to use yet. And, you know, if you look at any superhero, right? And I use this example with the kids. If you have Spider-Man, you know, when he has his webs at first, he's shooting himself in the face, he's falling off the building. You don't know how to use that power that you have that seems really weird and odd. I mean, webs shooting out of wrists, right? 
or any superhero, but that's the idea. There's parts of ourselves that we wish that would just go away and then we could be like everybody else when the truth is we're meant to be varied and different. And that is what makes us similar, actually. It's funny. I just realized as you were talking that's exa- that the book is exactly the point, right? That when all of us, but some of us more, more clearly have a challenge, rather than, and, and some people, and many people unfortunately do this, they, they compartmentalize it, oh, this is my, my challenge, let me go on with the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. But no, actually this, when you embrace it and understand its true power, becomes that thing that makes you special, becomes that thing that makes you powerful and brings you to your purpose in life. It's beautiful, mm-hmm. beautiful, thank you. So uh, we have a few minutes for, if anybody has any questions, comments, stories they want to share, please don't be shy. I see a raised hand here. We have the, the mic. Yes. Sorry. I guess my question is, it, when it turns from maybe a, a period of darkness that might lead to some growth to something where someone's harming themselves or like, you know, there's something physical or a drug addiction or something like that, it's really hard to just sit back or to even feel that that's going to lead to something good. Um, so I guess the question would be like, is there a moment where you need to step in and say, hey, um, you know, this has to end type thing? So, so the answer is, of course, yes, right? And this is both true for ourselves and true for those that we love or those that are, that are our friends. It's our, actually our responsibility if we can, you know, the, my father, the Robert, often used the, the phrase that often people embrace their chaos. Sometimes it's, it's in extreme cases, such as addiction, but all of us, you know, we, I've often seen people who, you know, are going through that moment of darkness, but really it's not that they are going through it, it's they're putting themselves in it. And, and some of the people, some people get energy from, oh, you know, telling their sad story to everybody that can listen. Some people, that happens through, through addiction. Of course, there are times, both to yourself and to others, you say, okay, no, no more of this, if you're, if you're talking to yourself. If you're talking to a friend, again, obviously addiction is it's a much bigger uh, topic and challenge, but, but certainly, certainly there are times internally to ourselves, to those that we love, to our friends, where it's not, an, we don't say, oh, I'm embracing that darkness for them. No, if I have the ability to, to interject, to cause an end to that, darkness for myself and for others, of course, it's our responsibility. And again, especially for ourselves, and again, addiction is a much a much more difficult one, but we all go through times, if we catch ourselves, we realize, you know, this is my story, my sad story, I just, I keep replaying it in my mind, but no, stop, you know, I don't know if anybody remembers, this is on YouTube, I recommend this, there's a Bob Newhart. Oh, it's also in my book, Rethink Love, exactly. that you've read so many yes, times. Yes, exactly. Yes. And I do rec- yes, so where, where he says, where he says, just stop it. Right. If you, yeah, you, I recommend watching. The point is, we. So when we talk about embracing darkness or embracing the, the the challenging times, it's not about wallowing in it. It's when it's happening to us, accepting and embracing it. But when there's the the way out, we we have to take it. When there's the ability to put an, an or a stop or at least to to bring it to to a, to a lower level, of course that's our responsibility. I just want to take a little bit of a different stance on this. I think that when it comes to things like people hugging their chaos, right? They want to stay in a situation and stay in a job that's a dead end for too many years and they were never happy there. I mean, those are choices, right? I think when you talk about things like addiction or um, an eating disorder, it's, it has a different hold on the person, right? There's other things going on physiologically, genetically things, right? I think in those situations, you ask the question, I'm sorry, I have my back to you, but I can't talk in the mic then. Um, How to show up for those people who are struggling in that way. I can only bring an example from my own life that I've written about also, is that it's, it's an idea of unconditional love. When I was in the throes of anorexia, and everybody, you know, I had people tell me, like, you know, tough love, just eat already. I mean, being selfish. I mean, I had a horrible thing. Like, just, what are you saying, actually? I'm, like, starving myself, not really because I want to, right? Um, but there was one person in my life at that time, and it was my father, who, as much as he was really a strong force and he, you know, was never shy about uh, telling you or yelling you, yelling at you his opinion, in this situation, I was so broken and I was so wounded that he didn't do that actually. He loved me through it and 
he stood by my side. And I think just having his energy there, not telling me to eat, not telling me what I was doing was wrong, not telling me how it was hurting other people that loved me, just being by my side. I remember being so comforted by that. And it didn't heal me. I had to do the healing. But it allowed me the space to have that process with less judgment because I felt a lot of judgment from other people who were scared by it. I understand, or, you know, they feared it. They didn't understand what was happening or why I was doing it. And to really emphasize the story at that time, I had this great idea to hike the Grand Canyon from rim to rim in one day. And the irony is you have an anorexic, a diabetic, <laughs> Um, another person who had an injury, you no, know, two diabetics and another person who something was with his leg. I don't know. We did it. And he went along with it, even though it was a crazy, really bad idea. And I remember though, he walked me through it, you know? So I would just say that, that, that really goes a long way. The person has to fight their own struggle, but just being there unconditionally does more than you might realize. I'll just, I'll add one, one thing. And uh, actually Malachi were talking about this the other way. They, I would strongly recommend there's a, there was an opinion piece in the New York Times a few days, maybe last week, by David Brooks. And he wrote about his best friend mm -hmm. who was suffering from depression and ultimately committed suicide. And it's, it's a beautiful piece, and I really recommend it. It's about friendship. It's about being there for people. And what he wrote, one of the things that he wrote, which I thought was very powerful, he said that he realized after the fact that his friend didn't need him to heal him. He needed to, to hear him and to be there mm -hmm. with him, which is, you know, often, again, every situation is different. You have to, you know, sometimes we, we, we try to fix a situation when really our place is to be there. And, and it, it's, it's a beautiful piece. I think, as I said, I recommend reading it, but it's, you know, it's, it's, there is no black or white in this. Sometimes it's about being tough and sometimes it's about being there and sometimes it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, but I think being mindful of that and really assessing the, what is the, the greatest benefit for that person at that time sometimes we don't know and i would say is you know uh being there unconditionally is almost never a bad thing so um the, one of the major themes you're talking about is embracing darkness obviously so can you elaborate a little bit on on those people certainly myself included that have a tendency occasionally to beat themselves up slash guilt in essence it sounds like it's the polar opposite of what you're describing and you don't grow from that situation. It sounds right. So, but if you can elaborate on on how beating yourself up slash guilt short circuits that process and doesn't help you grow, right? That right. Would certainly yes. helped me. And then and and part of that is, I think it's related. Is that just having no certainty or a lack of certainty that the that the lights in the business in essence? Yes. So what I would say is, is it's, it's a very important, because as anything that's true, it's all in the details. So one of the most important understandings is that where we find ourselves is exactly where we need to be. Now, we might have made a mistake and gotten there, but the fact that we made a mistake and got there doesn't mean that we didn't have to be there, right? So what that means is I made right, what do we what do we say to ourselves? I made a mistake and therefore I'm in this situation. And therefore I'm at fault and therefore I should feel guilty or beat myself up about being in this situation. But if you understand that I actually had to be in this situation. How I got there, my choice, but I had to be there. So a person makes a business decision, let's say, and he loses a significant amount of money. So what happens? A person says, oh, I'm such an idiot. Why did I make that mistake? And now I'm upset with myself and I feel guilty for having made that decision. But if you separate the cause and the effect, the effect of being in that situation of having lost that money, that's actually something that I needed to, to experience. Now, maybe I should learn from what got me there for next time so that I make better choices, but where I got to was actually where I needed to be. So there can't be any guilt or even regret. There can be a learning. Maybe I should make better decisions in this first in the cause, but the effect of it, which meaning where I find myself, is actually where I always needed to be. And when you really live life in that way and remind yourself of that, by then this is for the good and for the bad, right? So the, the, other, the other side of that coin is you made an amazing decision, you made a lot of money, oh, I'm amazing. No, well, actually, you know, the lot of the creator gave you that gift of money. Happens to me you made a good choice, so the cause and the effect are really separate. But you actually had to make that money. 
you happen to have, in your mind, have made a great business decision, and that's why you made the money, another person got an inheritance. He didn't make any choices. So where you get to is ultimately always where you need to be. What got you there can, is, not, is not the reason, right? But you can learn and make, maybe make better decisions next time. So when you really understand that where you wind up is always where you need it to be, there can't be any guilt, because guilt would mean that I'm in control of the whole process. I'm in control of where I got to. No, you're actually not. There's a much bigger force at play, and you need to wind up there. So what's, what's, can, what can the guilt be about? You know, Monica and I often talk about this in our home, you know, sort of, again, we learn to make better choices, but what happened is exactly what needed to happen. And it would have happened one way or the other. So guilt in that thought process should and is taken out of the equation. I would just add that blame and shame and guilt, they're all relatives. Uh, it's where growth ends. That's it. Once you feel those emotions, there is no changing, there's no transforming, there's no evolution. That's the end of it. Blame really is, I did something wrong, and now people will judge me or reject me. It's the fear of that. Shame is I did something wrong and now I am a bad person. There's something wrong with me. Both of those, where does growth and evolution and transformation come from if that's how you think about yourself? So even though you know all these things and you've heard all of these things, I'm sure spiritually speaking why it's important, just know that. As soon as you go to that emotion, that's it, game over until the next time. So it's just not worth it. And for me, that would be a reminder. I used to feel all of those emotions so completely and heavily and from a Middle Eastern family, you know, it's, we're raised very much with that kind of vocabulary and conversation. And then I just couldn't take it anymore because it was, it was making me really unwell. So it's possible to overcome it, but those, that really is the end of growth. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I have a question uh, about the internal process of getting through the darkness uh, because Oftentimes, our head is disconnected from our heart. And for me, at least, it's easier to sort of grit through my thinking process and say, OK, well, this is from the light. And yet, my heart, as you say, if we have to, if we have to love it, that, that's centered in the heart. So can you speak about those two different functions and how they both interplay when it comes to the darkness? Yes. So yeah. um, what I would say is, you know, often, people come to me and say, you know, why is this happening, right? So we need to understand, so we spoke really, but a lot of what we spoke about tonight is really, I would say soul, you can say heart, but it doesn't mean that we're gonna, we're gonna come to understand, oh, sometimes we do, right? But often we won't. I have, there's many things in my life that were challenging that I understand in retrospect, and there are many things that happened in my life that were challenging, I have no, I don't, I don't understand, and I also have no desire to understand, because it's like when we think about, you know, people think about, you know, you talk about even the scientific understanding of how, where this world came from. For any individual to think that I can come to understand everything, right, is silly, right? Our mind just doesn't have that capability. So when you realize that everything that happens in our life is part of a much more complex process, 99% of which we can't understand. We try to understand the 1% that we can. But if I accept that there's much greater positive forces involved in my life, then the desire or even ability to understand it is not even possible. What is possible is to experience it as positive. To understand it, not necessarily, but to experience it as positive. So therefore, when people come to me and say, you know, why is this happening? My answer always is, I can't necessarily explain to you why this is happening. I can tell you one thing that ultimately it will be for your benefit, and ultimately it's bringing you towards a blessing. And I, this is from experience, and I promise you, that the more you remind yourself of that, the more you will learn to love the darkness. But if your process is, how, no, I need to understand, I need to, I need to understand, it will almost never happen. It will almost never happen. So you're saying the head-heart connection is soul. Well, I think, well, I would say that in, as it comes to embracing the challenging times, the head is much less important than the heart and the soul, which means it's not about understanding why it's happening. It's about experiencing it and knowing that it has a purpose. And then that can bring you to embracing it and ultimately even loving it. I often find whatever feels stuck in my head, if I stop and I let it filter down to my heart, then I get the clarity. 
that I need. It's when it stays in the head or it's only in the heart. You get into trouble. It has to actually be connected completely. And most people are either head or heart, and it's really connecting the two. Continue to send your questions, comments, and stories to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. And we hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. Stay spiritually hungry. Thank you.